I wanted to first have a bit of a review of the Roscon meetup, though because of, I'm not sure whether everyone was there. I mean, most of the people that are on the call were there, but um, we we had this meetup on the 20th, and then um, yeah, basically Thomas was here was there. Um, there there was this Michael Gray from um, Intrinsic. I have asked him also to present. He will probably hopefully present on the in the December meeting. Um, what they do in the Open RMF in terms of deliberation. Um, then Francisco presented his course sense. I would also ask him again if he maybe wants to present this some more because in his earlier presentation that he gave, I think it was in the very first meeting. This was um, this was mainly on plants actually, and as far as I understand, with this current project, they want to move all of this closer to ROS and then especially ROS two as well. So this could be interesting. I just talked a little bit about convince, and then yeah, the VGP actually said that he wants to start to write things down. I mean, in terms of the standardization, and also I created this rep, MP rep with him. And, and then we as a group said basically that we are happy to review the stuff on and then get in a discussion when he does so. Um, yeah, that's that. And then generally, I mean, this in this afternoon break at Roscon, this was when the, was when the meetup happens. And then generally, the, the uh, I mean, we had already the outlook in this session. I think it was generally quite interesting. David also maybe wants to join the working group and also um, maybe wants to present some new work that, that he's doing. Um, then of course Matthias, who already presented in our working group as well. Uh, Thomas, who will present today. And then there was something with AirPods. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my, uh, this would be the overview of um, Roscon. Um, I think especially when the when the videos come out, I will probably again write something about it, or and also include these talks into our awesome group, awesome uh, repository. Um, and then originally there was the plan to have a um, presentation by Inia. He is working at Antibiotics now, but he used to be in also these some of the EU final projects that kind of preceded ours. That's how I got the contact, but somehow there was something about IP issues that didn't allow him to present. So I, I kept it here to keep um, to keep it in mind, but unfortunately it's uh, crossed out. But luckily, I have one Thomas to present today. Thomas gave the presentation at Roscon on Petrinets that they actually use in their product as far as I understood. And um, I think, yeah, it would be cool if you could give us a bit of a maybe more practical take on how you use the behavior trees to actually control or to do this deliberation of a robot. I think this would be interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, so not behavior trees, but battery nets. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe I mix up the <laughs> Um, They're all graphs. <laughs> in the end, it's all just one formula. Um, let me see. You should be able to present now. Okay. Uh, so just a little bit of expectation management. Um, what I prepared for today is uh, slightly, probably short of now among the same time, but a little bit different from what I presented at Roscon. It's a little bit more on the practical side, uh, in particular with regard to how to build up a bigger application from smaller battery nets, instead of having one very big complicated one, and a little bit more specific how it is implemented in the library that I presented. Uh, for everyone who's unfamiliar with Patronets, I will also very, very briefly explain it. Uh, I will start with sharing my screen, but I first need to allow Microsoft Teams to do things on my computer. 
Uh, and for that, I need to quit Teams and rejoin the meeting. So give me one second. <laughs> okay, awesome. Okay, that was uh, quite a long introduction and not very interesting. So I'll keep this one uh, short. So at Roscon, I uh, introduced Petrinets and explained uh, what they roughly were and uh, how we, well, not explicitly how we use them. Uh, but I want you to know that we do use them in particular on that drone that you see in the middle of the screen which flies around these uh, big commercial uh, aircraft and they are looking for damages with a big camera. And uh, we used to come from a, a behavior tree setup uh, and uh, over time, and uh, by time I mean uh, about three years, the behavior tree grew quite a while, of quite a bit, uh, up to the level that we actually couldn't really, um, yeah, reason about what was going on or at some very particular states actually understand what was going on. So at a certain point we were uh, making a decision whether to refactor the behavior tree that we had or to go some other route and um, yeah we kind of tried both but then one of the attempts uh, developed much quicker than the other and that's how we ended up uh, using PetriNets as the actually the coordination algorithm for our uh, system. So, next. Uh, so, what are we going to talk about? I have to just click a bunch of times uh, until I say so. Until this thing is complete. So, which is one more. Uh, this is a little bit awkward, but so okay for this slide. Um, this, what I want you to know is PetriNets is something that is not invented recently. It's been around for a very long time, and it's actually very popular because well, it's kind of popular in uh, differences, different fields, uh, mostly because there's a quite heavy uh, set of tools which you can use to do formal checks on your model. And some industries or applications, they tend to like that a lot. Uh, so, and they're, as far as I know, one of the few tools that actually give you this. Then 60 years later, uh, around now, it's when uh, we developed the C++ PetriNet library. Basically, a lot, most of the work has been done by me so far. Um, and it's actually nothing else than a PetriNet execution library. That means that if you have models of PetriNet in some kind of application, there are many uh, which you can use, and you save them in a particular XML format, then uh, this little C++ library parses the XML uh, and then much like in behavior trees, you can bind callbacks to transitions in this PetriNet and then it will just execute them in the order that they are specified according to the PetriNet. So that is what the library that I built is uh, simply doing. Then for the specialization of today, I will in between briefly recap what PetriNets are and how they look. And then I want to continue on to the two ways of um, the two ways that I have implemented in this library is in how you can combine it, which is nesting and composing. And at the end of this presentation, I think it makes sense to, uh, now I will tell you where, what I'm going to develop further for this applicant for this library. Um, but I'm also curious for the deliberation work group, if this is relevant and if so, yeah, uh, where we can go next. Next slide. Please. Yeah, I'm sorry. Ah, that, that's okay. So um, very briefly, it's a modeling language and it's nice, it's both graphical, but there's also a mathematical uh, way to write this down. But it boils down to that's a little graph and there are things called places, which and P1 and P2 are examples and there are transitions of which T1 is an example. Click once more. And the final concept is a token, yeah, no, which you, you <laughs> which you should see as um, sort of a resource. And what the current picture means is that all the input places for transition one now have a resource, which means that transition one is enabled and it could fire. And if you probably, if you click now, it will fire, I hope, or disappear. Hey, if you, ah, there, there we go. Then it's active. It has consumed its uh, pre-conditioned resource. And once it's done firing, it will produce a post-condition uh, resource. Ah, so that's basically the idea. And you can 
uh, make these nets, of course, as complicated as you like, which is the next slide. Um, we're not going to click through it because that's going to be a little bit awkward. So, uh, but what I want you, ah, apparently not, this time it works. <laughs> but the point is that this is an example of how you can make the transitions T2 and T4 actually work in parallel. And you see, you see that it actually happens at transition one where the process is forked into two processes. Then these T2 and T4 can individually be ran. And then around T3, I think in the top of my head, is where the two processes join each other again. And that's where uh, a token ends up in P1. And uh, in this particular example, this Petrinet will loop infinitely. And uh, so that's, uh, yeah modeling uh, freedom, if you like that. So the idea is always with these kind of things that uh, it's, if you have little nice examples then it's very concise and you can reason about them, but when they start to get bigger, if you want to build a real application, if you want to incorporate multiple forms of coordination for different situations, these nice graphical models tend to grow into huge ugly things. And at a certain moment there will be some arc between two very distant pieces of this model and then uh, yeah the whole advantage of being to uh, graphically reason on these systems kind of disappears and that's where the part the interesting part comes in through how can I chop them up into smaller systems and how can I make sure that if I put them back together again I can still reason about how this thing works and I think if we go to the next slide that's not what I wanted to talk about, but also important. Um, one of the, so next to nesting and composing nets, a different way to make them more concise is by adding these things called colors. And by adding colors, you can kind of uh, create some logic when uh, transitions output different situations. So a transition can, for instance, fail and you would make it output a different kind of token than when it would succeed. And uh, this is also a very interesting way and a very effective way to keep your battery nets smaller than uh, if you want to reach the same kind of behavior or expressiveness with just black and uh, with just black tokens. So in this particular example, uh, you can just click through it. The idea is that T1 can output either a blue or a red token. And in the case that it's a red token, it will be consumed by the red transition. And in the situation that it will produce a blue token, it will be consumed by the blue transition. And this is a bit a, a way how to uh, also keep your model, your Petri net a little bit smaller without having to uh, sacrifice uh, the, any of the formal parts of your uh, uh, formal verification advantages that you generally tend to have when you use battery nets. Then we come to the thing that I mostly want to talk about today, which is the combining battery nets. So um, for some reason, I tried to do a little bit of literature research of uh, what has been said about this, but interestingly enough, it's, it's a subject that has been come more popular in the past five, six years. I don't know who of you is familiar with uh, the art or science of category theory. I am definitely not, but uh, these guys seem to have taken a great interest in how to uh, combine Petri nets and also being able to reason about the bigger thing. Um, so, it's interesting that a lot of people are thinking about this. I have taken a little bit more practical approach uh, and have yeah, come up with two uh, methods of composition, basically, uh, which I didn't make up my own. I just took the ones that seemed useful. So the uh, question is, when is it composable? I think this is the most important question that I have, and this is my interpretation. I'm very curious about what you guys think, so we can talk about that on the end, but for me, click twice, I think. Um, so there's a difference between uh, gluing stuff together and then hit run and see how it works. And I think uh, the, uh, yeah, for me, I have decided to just call, if you can, is it, if it is easy to put together, then you have just made something that's nice and modular. Uh, if it is easy, to stuff together while still being able to tell something about the 
the working of the whole thing, sort of the composition of systems, then I think this is, uh, then I call it like proper composition uh, so that you can also reason about the result of the big thing based on what the small parts do. And in Petrinets in specific for particular, that in particular that means that um, it's very interesting with a Petrinet that you can simulate uh, which states you can actually reach and which states you cannot reach. And if you have two Petri nets and for both you know uh, the reachability graph, and if you then compose them together, how does the total reachability graph look like? Um, and because uh, if you can, uh, yeah, if this composition tells you how that uh, works, without having to sort of brute force again the whole uh, reachability state, that's a very powerful uh, validation tool, so to say. And the second thing that's always interesting for Petrinets to ask is, uh, I have a sequence of events that I really do not want to happen. Uh, can they happen? And if you then decide to add a little Petrinet because you want to extend your system, but you still want to be sure can this particular sequence of events uh, be prevented or can I prove that it does not happen, then it would be nice if your form of composition actually uh, allows you to say yes or no. If you add this, then the sequence will, of events will still not happen or yes, if you add this, then this will actually start happening. Um, click, I think. Uh, so in symmetry, we have uh, implemented composition uh, according to this paper that is in number four, which is called, I think, Open Big Tree Nets it's by Bas, and uh, it's actually relatively straightforward. Is what they say is that if you just isolate the sets of your Patreon net, which you call inputs, have places which you call inputs, and if you isolate a set of places that you call outputs. Um, then we have a few methods for you to uh, say something about the reachability graph of your composed Patreon. So to me, that sounded uh, as a nice thing to have. So I decided to go with that form of composition. If you wanted to, uh, uh, if you wanted to put two nets together. So how does this work in practice? Click. And um, so we have one tiny Petri net, which is just one place. And uh, we got the task bucket and which has six places of six tokens. And then we have a second Petri net click, uh, which is a little uh, task processor. So uh, just to very briefly explain how this thing works is that there's a task bucket. It's exactly, as you can see, has the same name as the task bucket in the other graph, um, which means that if you would compose these two Petri nets, these uh, two task buckets, task buckets would effectively be the same one. It's like an alias or a link of how, however you want to see it. So if you would then play this Petri net, then it would consume uh, one by one the tasks that are in a task bucket. If it fails, it will return them via the little red transition. If they succeed, it will end up in the uh, bucket of successful tasks. Now suppose if we add another Petri net, click, um, then this one is a bit more complicated, but what it basically is, is instead of a two-step processing mechanism, it is, instead of a one-step processing mechanism, it's a two-step processing system. But again, you can see that there's the same task bucket place and there's the same successful tasks place. So if you glue all these nets together by joining them on the input and on the output uh, sets, then you can still run this and this will then actually create a new Patreonet, which is just basically the sum of all these parts. And if the uh, places are the same, it will join them as one. Um, and then you can play it. So in this case, uh, you would then be able to use your normal uh, simulation tools for Petri nets. 
And this is the part where it is a bit sad that I cannot effectively share my screen because I wanted to show how I use the program Great SPN to in particular uh, simulate these things. And uh, yeah, so that's actually very sad. I can try once more to see what happens if I share my screen, but I doubt. Does this do anything to anyone? No. No, okay. That's, that's well, not for me. Ah. No, okay. So this is just, uh, yeah, unfortunate. Can you, sorry, can you maybe explain this again? The, you say these other places that are called task bucket and the other two patronets that are kind of aliases. This means kind of, I can also think of them containing the six tokens, right? Yes. If, so if you feel exactly like that. It's exactly like that. So actually, I should just, uh, so that would also mean that in the resulting patronet of this thing, there would be two uh, outward going arrows from the task bucket. So once to the this black transition in the inter, oh, they're all black, but to this uh, transition in uh, next to the text intermediate, and it would also go one next to the task result one. And that's also the the little token that you see above them in the resource single processor and the resource dual processor places. Those are, it's a very normal way in Petrinets to prevent the transition that is linked to it from being able to immediately train the task bucket. So it will only now take one task at a time. It will try to process it. And in the case of failure or in the case of success, it will put back a token in this resource place, which allows it to only then start with the next task bucket. It's a way how to sort of uh, make sure that your system uh, or that your Patreon doesn't eat up all the task bucket uh, tokens at once. On the other hand, if that is what you want, then you should just make it like that. But it's uh, a way to show it. So, and and uh, would you yeah. also like combine these two patronets that we see here by them gluing them together? Uh, if you would, so what if you would do the resource single processor, which if you would give it the same name as the resource dual processor, what that semantically would mean, for instance, is that it would that that token then would represent one operator, and that both these patronets are uh, two machines. And that because there's only one operator to operate the machine, they have to kind of fight for the operator. So depending, and then it will be used in one of the two machines. Okay. Um, but if you would, for instance, initialize this whole net with, and they would also share the resource uh, place, but then you could, for instance, also put in two tokens to represent two operators or to uh, whatever you need to run them in parallel, but uh, it is different from this example because then you do not specify in your model uh, which, so say, resources is tied to which uh, machine. Because if you don't specify it, it could still be that all the processes are being done by the single uh, processor unit, or actually, by definition, it would be random which machine would, um, yeah. Yeah. We will process the task. So, uh, but these are in the end things that you, as the person who is modeling the application using these patronets, should take into consideration what you uh, want to achieve. And I must say, in practice, it's uh, uh, sometimes confusing, <laughs> but it takes some. Uh, but the, the good part is that a lot of these confusions you can already figure out in the designing part of your Patreonet, because you will just forward simulate it. And if there are two uh, transitions fighting over a single resource, that's basically the part where your simulator will say, hey, I have to make a decision. And uh, usually that's where you say, oh, you shouldn't have to. And then you know you have to redesign it. And that's before you even start implementing anything C++-ish. So that is for uh, the... So this is one way of 
composing uh, Petrinets that is implemented in my library. How it works is that you basically load two or three or any amount of XMLs, and as long as you make sure that in their XMLs they have the same name for the same tasks, it will join them on those places and will output one big net. Then we go on to the uh, second uh, form of composition, which is, uh, oh, I made a lot of nice graphics. <laughs> you can click ah, to the next slide. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful, yeah, yeah. Okay. So then we go to the nesting part, which is actually a lot more straightforward uh, than the composition part. So if we again have this little processor, then click once more. The idea is basically that inside a single transition, you can itself put a whole Patreon net. And um, so this is in that sense very different because now uh, the because of the hierarchy, it's not two uh, machines working in process, but it's actually one machine working inside the other. Um, so if you click two or three times more, there comes a little bit of text. So, in the yeah, so the idea is that a whole patronet in itself can behave the same as a transition, and what that basically means is that you need to have a very clearly defined end for the patronet, sort of a goal marking that you expect to reach when you can say, okay, now this is done. Because if the containing patronet, so the, the right part would be, for instance, an, one that would go on for infinity, then the parent patronet would never stop because the particular transition would never finish. So that is um, sort of a, a constraint on, on when that you have to take into account when you decide to nest patronets. If you click once more, there's one implementation detail that I think is nice, is that um, in symmetry, or, uh, you have to upfront uh, allocate a little thread pool, but could be also the whole event loop or any kind of uh, thread pool library that you would like to use. Um, and you can either decide that each battery net, also the nested ones, have their own uh, thread pool or you can make them use each other's uh, uh, thread pool and that is nice if you want to be in control of which patron net executes, executes on which thread uh, but sometimes you just simply don't care you have a bunch of threads and some of the patron net some of the transitions can just run on uh, wherever if you don't have a preference so that's this kind of uh, designing freedom that you have but also have to mentally take into account that uh, if you keep on nesting patronets but keep on using the same thread pool, then you slowly eat up threads because for each, for each uh, patronet there is a new event loop that uh, parses all the uh, mutations to its own transition. So that's a little, a little bit tricky, I would say, to nesting patronets. Uh, but other than that, it's actually the, the simplest form of composition because you also don't really have to take into account the, how the composing affects the, the whole patronet because you only have to look at the uppermost patronet. Yeah, or we are lost because Anne is the one who's moving. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I lost it too. I lost it too. Okay. Ah, there's a new. I one. am back. Ah, yes. We are. It was. We are <laughs> format number four now. Ah. Interesting. This is the most buggy. Uh, application I've used in quite a time. Um, okay, so uh, this was the part about nesting these patron nets. So that's the simpler form of, com of uh, composition because then you only have the patron net itself that you encapsulate doesn't actually affect the formalities of the parroting net. Okay, and there can we I maybe ask? So I, I guess this transition still only fires if you have these two tokens, right? Yeah. And yes. if it fires, then it executes this patronet. 
by exactly inserting tokens at a predefined place yes so that's one little bug that you actually found here is that next to uh defining the goal marking you also need to be very explicit in defining the initial marking for your patronet because in this example indeed there's nothing in the task bucket so this patronet would immediately exit because there's nothing to do yeah um so you would have to put a token in that one uh to make sure that it does the thing you want to do and that's also why in the library that i made uh the initial and the goal markings are something you explicitly pass when you construct a petri net so it's kind of you have to uh very explicitly do it wrong if you do it wrong <laughs> um yeah, yeah, but indeed, so you need to, in this case, this particular picture that I drew, draw for you is wrong in the sense that it would do nothing. Okay, well, but if you add a... Then you mark task bucket again as a kind of start token. Yeah. And then, yeah. I don't know, probably successful task or whatever. That would be the goal marking. So if you indeed, what I would expect in this case, what I and what I had in mind is that you would... Uh, put one task in the task bucket and if it finishes successfully it would end up in the successful task and that would be your goal marking yeah and then then and then it you would have exit here, right? yeah exactly and also maybe uh i don't need to say this but just to be explicit so the names in the parent net the task bucket and the test results it have nothing to do with the ones that are in the right net it's just laziness of me to reuse the same net for the same example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if there are any more questions about next of uh, nesting, then I think we can go to one of the final slides. So um, it is again, a little bit sad that I was unable to share my screen because I also wanted to show a little bit of the code of these two examples. I will um, push them to uh, Git and I will send them uh, around so you can at your own time uh, look at it. I will yeah, ask Hankel to uh, Chris to uh, send them around. Sure. But just FYI, uh, for my library, stuff that's on my short-term to-do list is that I'm going to finish this part where you can actually use colors. Um, there's some compatibility with uh, some analysis tools that I would like to make a bit nicer so that it's easy, more easy to uh, yeah, switch between the analysis tool and executing the things in the library. Uh, and also some more examples and some general ideas on how you should use it. Uh, so that's my own piece of work. And just so you know that I'm going to be doing that anyway. The second bullet point in this list is actually more a question. And that's, I think, where we can have a discussion is how does this uh, click, by the way, uh, how does this how is this interesting for uh, ah, okay, random point that I kind of vaguely addressed, but the bottom point is most important um, because I'll be developing my little library in context of what we do here at Mainblades and uh, also based on what I find interesting, but I am also very open to uh, original input or some ideas or maybe to see it as a part of a bigger whole, but yeah, for me, that's a relatively unknown area. So my first question would be, uh, uh, was this interesting for you guys at all? And in what sense, uh, yeah, uh, does this relate to the, the work of the deliberation work group? Yeah, although I can say that it's definitely interesting. I mean, to be honest, I was skeptical or I'm, maybe I'm still skeptical, but it just is practical, but I mean, it's still another formulation that maybe, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm definitely sure that the popularity of behavior trees at the moment is nothing that's inherent to behavior trees. It's just, just like a trend that happens with everything with any language. Um, and yeah, I mean, for us, it's super relevant if, if I can speak about the Convince project, because of course, this verifiability was also, is, is kind of one of the main ideas in convince and we kind of want to solve this by making behavior trees verifiable but um, you can all see uh, some
someone called Matteo Palmas in the call. He is a PhD student currently at Bosch, um, also in the project, and he basically goes the route of transforming behavior trees into Petri nets to make them verifiable, which of course is then again not really readable, but uh, yeah, as, as you said, there are a lot of tools and a lot of formal framework around behavior Petri nets, and therefore this of course makes sense. And if we can then, and I would also, I would also really like some kind of comparison. I, I'm all about also comparing these, I would compare about comparing the behavior trees to a, a state machine of the same function. And if we kind of have in the end some kind of little list of little um, examples where kind of the same behavior is defined in a Petri net, in, in a state machine and in a behavior tree, then maybe this would also help people to decide what is the right formalism for the job. And, and maybe truth is always mm -hmm. kind of a combination of these, maybe they are, I think they're also re only really powerful if you kind of use the right tool for the right job. But I would, I'm very happy to have Petri nets in this collection of toolbox. And with your library, I think it's also super use, usable in ROS. And um, um, yeah, thank you very much for your presentation. You are welcome. Also, th thank you all for your time and interest. Uh, I see there's one question. Yes, I, have I would question. just say. Um, so I'm not sure if I understood it correctly, but um, correct me if I'm wrong. So um, your tooling is basically usable for writing, designing Petri nets, and then also analyzing and running them. But um, uh, yeah. So it's mostly for executing them. So I okay. use existing tooling, in particular. I use Great SPN, which is this uh, ancient uh, application with a decent GUI that's like drag and drop. And from there, I can export it to uh, uh, a few XML files, and my library is able to parse those and run them. Okay, so it's basically based on input given in PNML. Yes. Exactly. And you are currently designing your Petri nets graphically. You are not having um, any any kind of tooling to just write it down, um, configuring nodes and um, and uh, yeah places and so on. Uh, no, no, exactly. So our so we have an application that is uh, a drone flying. A, a bunch of waypoints, avoiding obstacles, dealing with uh, manual takeover things, uh, and a bunch of these, uh, any, what I want to explain, just a bunch of functionalities. And um, for now, it is still, uh, yeah, say, for a human uh, cognitive load, it's still very doable to have it in smaller Petri nets and combine them. And in our application, we actually only use hierarchical nesting. <clears throat> so not the composition that I've uh, shown you before. Um, so, and there has so far has been no desire or need to put another layer of abstraction on actually generating the Petri nets themselves. Those are for our application all handwritten uh, yeah, and actually initially derived from the behavior tree that we had. Okay, good. Then I, I have two other questions. Uh, first, um, so your intention or goal is to somehow connect your tooling to already existing PetriNet verification tooling, right? Uh, you can check I, yeah. your PetriNets. So my main goal in that sense was to not uh, to not being yeah, to not having to re-implement an application like Groot in behavior trees myself um, and also in particular all the formal uh, formal alg the algorithms that they have to check formalities I think it's very ineffective if I reinvent the wheel just for my own application okay. so and what I missed yeah do you have already ideas on how to put your Petri nets into some already existing verification tooling. So do you really want to use the PNML format to just put it into existing verification tooling? Or do you want to uh, transform your uh, PNML, um, somehow reduce it, somehow optimize it, and then later give it to the verification process? 
Um, so in essence, from the main blade slash my company perspective, currently there's no interest in any of those things. So during the development of our patronets, we could use some of the reachability graphs and uh, to, yeah, to figure out what is reasonable and we could uh, yeah, find some bugs in our system and we were able to flatten them out. So, but there, again, if you look at a lot of Patrinet literature, they are talking about very complex systems like molecular uh, kind of things at a large scale. And there it makes no sense to sort of, uh, yeah, work your way through a graphical editor and look at readability graphs, yeah, with your own eyes because those are way too big. But the interesting part, I think, for a lot of uh, robotic behavior, of robotic coordination, I would actually say that at a certain level, these nets are actually not that big at all. And for us, uh, if you get, uh, we noticed that when we got a little bit used to thinking uh, with Patreon nets, then a lot of behaviors actually became very um, evident and easy to implement. And uh, so I'm going to deviate a little bit from your question, but to have one little anecdote is that if you just look at a behavior tree, then if you want to simply have a sequence of events, it stylistically looks very weird to have a tree and that you kind of have to go up, of down, up, down, up, down, up, down. It makes no sense if you just want to do A, B, C, D. And um, we noticed that a lot of, uh, sequence in our robotic applications are just uh, actually very sequential with just a few long-term tasks usually running in parallel. And those are in a Petrinet very easy to describe and also very easy to digest uh, what's going on. Um, so that was the end of the anecdote. And to go back to your question, so we don't have a uh, from a company perspective, a huge interest in going super deep into trying to optimize the Petri nets themselves. Our main concern is that we want to be able to keep understanding them and being able to modify them as we find new requirements for our application and be able to add them and uh, without uh, yeah, being totally surprised by how it affects the system. Uh, me personally, and I'm also this op this library is also my personal open source project, and my company is basically, of uh, not my company, but the company where I work is a user of mine. <laughs> um, uh, but for me personally, I would be very interested to, uh, yeah, explore other, uh, uh, yeah, Patreon related topics. But that's just me trying to grow my knowledge. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, I mean, as Christian already said, we at Bosch are also thinking in those directions. Um, and then, so I did not have a look at your tooling before this talk. I just came here and, and listened. Um, so, but what is the, the concrete contribution of your tooling compared to other Petrina tooling around here? Is it the compositionality you propose here? Or what can mm. I do with your tool, what is not possible with other tooling out there? I, uh, I would say, very bluntly put, probably not that much. Uh, but uh, I took as an approach that it is as much familiar to ex people who are used to behavior trees and try to minimize the effort of transitioning from uh, such a setup to if you want to use Petri nets. Also, I actually have not really found a C++ library uh, implementing the Petri nets in a way that um, you can use them as how I suggest. Uh, so the, the behavior tree uh, way, which is which I very much like, is that there's a uh, you have a lot of runtime freedom because you can parse these uh, behavior trees at runtime. And you can sort of dynamically link functionality to uh, what these functions should do. Um, and a lot of the Patronet tooling that Patronet C++ or C libraries that are around, very much like to focus on 
uh, the typed systems that's behind it try to make it all some kind of big compile time uh, machine. Uh, and I think for robotics, that is less interesting because you simply want to be able to switch between machines in certain situations. And also, as a developer, developing code, it makes a lot of sense that you can uh, yeah, switch out different implementations for different uh transitions if you uh yeah without having to recompile your entire code base or something so as in the composition i described for instance it's not unique although i haven't found any c++ kind of library that does this for you similar to how i implemented it uh so yeah i'm not sure if that's a very satisfying answer i think I just happen to be in this tiny little bit of tiny little space of robotics people trying to you yeah who are used to uh, binding functions runtime to some kind of uh, graphical model and would like to maintain that freedom uh, then this uh, patronet library uh, helps them doing just that yeah. okay great uh, no but this answers my question and as I said it's really interesting um, for us um, I guess Jamie also raised his hand and had some questions, so maybe he's. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, I gotta I gotta drop off. I put one in the chat. I'll I'll, I'll just read it. Basically, uh, it would be interesting to understand the verification goals that are being used with the Petri nets, and understand what it would take to add those to behavior trees, because that work may not be uh, excessive. So I think it's worth exploring. And then just general, what are the pros and cons of two of the two two approaches? I think the the instincts that you talk about with behavior trees and being able to handle sequential lists more easily and more naturally, that's a great pro. It'd be really great to to try to put together a list of both approaches because if there is a desire to gain uh, momentum around uh around this approach it's going to be met with some resistance right there's already momentum using behavior trees so it'd be good to, to get in front of that discussion so we can have a more uh intelligent uh discussion with other stakeholders in the robotics community in the ross community yeah great that's a really great question and basically matteo is trying to answer it <laughs> in his first paper yeah. of his phd <laughs> Yeah, I uh, I also understand the question, and I think it is, makes a lot of sense. I would also like to actually point out that there's nothing technically preventing people from putting a behavior tree into a transition or a petri net into a leaf node. So um, there are, uh, yeah, it, it doesn't need to be necessarily, in my opinion, pet against each other, but... Uh, I can also understand that is that there is a natural discussion that tends to uh, bubble up if you uh, put them uh, uh, opposing each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would be at least for my part uh, be completely fine with at least making maybe a start of the list for the con the things that we took into consideration, uh, which were uh, yeah sort of decisive points for us. Okay. I think that'd be great if you have a starting point and then others can can weigh in. That would be that'd be phenomenal. And then even building on top of that, if we do think there's a desire to have a hybrid model where people would use both, then it really pushes towards this whole semantics discussion. You know, getting uh, a bit formal on what we call things and what tooling we're going to use to guide that naming if there's a particular standard PetriNet tooling that we want to leverage or inherit, yeah. you know, deciding that sooner rather than later can be helpful. We have the same issue with behavior trees, right? Where we have different terms or the same terms sometimes that mean different things depending on what context yeah. that term is being yeah. used. So, but this is phenomenal. Thank you, Thomas, for sharing this. I, I learned a lot and it's in my mind is uh, spinning, but I do have to, I do have to log off. Uh, see you soon. Bye. You're welcome. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think we could also, additionally, we can also think about the state machine. I think this was also a valid candidate that people would use in these places. 
Mm-hmm. And, and I think also something that we could think about not only defining these things internally, but also defining the interface so that the, the kind of how are your actions, your conditions, how are your in the, in the, the orchestra, your firing conditions defined so that you can interchange, exchange these. Yeah. yeah, good. A lot of work, a lot of open questions. Um, yeah. Thomas, if I, if I can uh, give you my, my input. Uh, I, I hope, Thomas, okay. Yeah, I, I hear you, okay. fine. Okay, perfect. Um, so uh, regarding the composition of uh, two patrons, uh, one interesting uh, book that I found is Understanding Patrons, mm-hmm. in which uh, uh, the, help, the author uh, tried to simplify a bit the, the, the understanding of how you, uh, you get to know the patrons, and he used something called interfaces uh, to generalize this concept of input output of a patron. Mm-hmm. So you uh, you use transition in order to uh, to get them, uh, but uh, he instead used this general uh, term called the interface in which you can also specify um, the amount of tokens inside a system and also other parameters that might be interesting for um, uh, for the understanding of, of how it works. Um, another thing is, I, I was curious about uh, one thing you say. Uh, you said that uh, behavior trees, when they become too large, they become a little bit unwieldy. And I was wondering if you have a ballpark of how big one uh, can be in order to become this, uh, this uh, unfriendly. Let's call it like this. Um... Okay, so <laughs> just to have an idea, we uh, I used to have two uh, full HD monitors, and if I would split the whole thing, if I would expand everything, it would not fit on both monitors. Um. So that was a cognitive sort of flow, but also from an implementation perspective, because I'm not exactly sure if the behavior tree number four actually still works that way, but behavior tree version three, if the larger your tree grows, uh, the more random nodes this thing keeps on ticking before it actually gets to the part of execution where you're actually at in the tree. That's kind of the, if I recall correctly, what I found a very not so intuitive way of figuring out what to do is that you first have to check if the 100 things you did before do not need to be redone for some reason. And this stuff gets even more complicated if you actually actively lo- use the, the Blackboard and use stuff that's saved inside the Blackboard to decide whether some leave notes or not should return false or true. Sure. And so I think that's one of the things that, uh, so depending on how many Blackboard variables you used for deciding whether leaves should or should not fail, versus uh, if you really have a very, uh, what's it called, a high width behavior tree, then you're basically ticking a lot and actually only increasing the odds of, yeah, maybe that one of these million uh, leaf nodes suddenly out of nowhere pops uh, back. So there's no real number, but I do know that what we had, we had around, uh, I don't know, say, uh, 30 branches of in the width, and that was way too much to comprehend. But then again, it's also this incrementally grown thing. I don't know how representative it was or is for properly implemented behavior trees. Um, but that's also when I tried to find those, I also understand that not many companies are failing willing to open source their very neatly designed behavior trees that might be the core part of their product, but in practice, I I haven't found that many beautiful behavior trees in real life. And that also made me a bit um, skeptical about whether it was such a good idea to redo it uh, at Mainblades. Okay, I um, I, I found, uh, I'm, I'm working on trying to verify this behavior trees. Mm-hmm. And of course, uh, since they do not have a formal um, semantics, uh, some some 
formal thing that I can base the, the validation on, I decided to move to PetriNet. And my yeah. problem now is uh, get the best model I can get in order to uh, increase performance in the validation because the more state you have, the, the bigger the model is, the harder the validation problem is. Yeah. So uh, what I what I found out is that uh, trying to find the point where it gets unwieldy uh, is a, a, a hint on trying to optimize that behavior tree in some sense, because it's semantics itself. Yeah. It's uh, it gets a bit uh, problematic. It, 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 it it's a burden instead of something that helps you determine yeah. where the give it three will will go so it was uh one of uh the the contribution that i hope to to give with my first paper nice okay yeah i i wrote that could you maybe share a link to that paper or a title in the list or the document the, itself uh the my paper or the book your paper. No, the book I will uh, probably... The, the paper is still uh, a work in progress. Ah, so okay. <laughs> I, I will try to, to have it uh, 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 reviewed, uh, reviewed uh, on January. I hope mm -hmm. it will get accepted. And uh, hopefully by June next year, uh, we I can, I can publish it. Okay. So then I'll it, just it... be patient. <laughs> uh, but, but this is the book, right, Matteo? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is the book. Okay, I, I will put this into the um, documentation. And then Thomas, also feel free to send me links or anything that you want me to put in there. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm also curious, do you have, you mentioned that category theory people are interested in page relets, if you have like a reference on that or something? Would be uh, yeah, in, in particular, so this, uh, the, I, I, I will send some uh, links to that, but in particular it has a, uh, a bunch of people very enthusiastic in the blockchain smart contract scene Ooh, okay. that use uh, so that <laughs> I personally am not a very big fan of uh, that technology being applied to those kind of things, but uh, they, it is very interesting work. So I will share that, okay. what I found there. Good. If there are no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for attending. Um, let, let's keep it this way. Let, let's say we, we better have like a few very good participants than super many. <laughs> um, Other, so, otherwise, this would be very long meetings. Exactly, exactly. And then we also want to keep them interactive. So, yeah. Good. Great. Thank you very much for the talk. Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for your input as well. Um, are you okay if I just convert your slides into PDF and also put them in the protocol? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I will double check uh, if there's something very silly on there, but I think not. And then uh, yeah, I'm uh, completely you fine with it. Another PDF or something. Yeah. Okay. So just to have it straight for myself, I will follow up. I will uh, share with uh, you some uh, pros and cons that for an evil comparison between the BTs and the PetriNets. Um, some links on this recent advancement in composition of PetriNets and this uh, recent or nice version of uh, the presentation that you can put online. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you can also, you should also have access to comment you can suggest changes to the protocol and then i can just accept ah. if you want to you can just okay put whatever Clear. on here the check has disappeared for yeah i need to write things okay. down because otherwise i definitely forget doing it good then have a nice week everyone yes Bye. Bye. thank you very much thank you thank you